Yes, yeah, so I'm delighted to be joined by Anders Sandberg, who is a research fellow at the Future of Humanity Institute at the University of Oxford. Um, so, say first of all, Anders, thank you very much for your time. Um, now, the obvious place to start, I, I, I didn't do one question on this, but obviously one of the things your centre looks at quite a lot is kind of existential risk, um, potential extinction events of the human species. Um, how much has the, the coronavirus surprised you? Is that the kind of thing you were worried about? Uh, normally, the uh, things like the coronavirus or stuff we mention as an example, but it's kind of below the radar for what we deal with at the Institute. It's a kind of a known kind of disaster that uh, we feel like, OK, others can handle. So in many ways, we were pretty unsurprised by it. On the other hand, it's, of course, tremendously disruptive and uh, bad. Uh, so uh, we're deeply annoyed by it. But it's not <laughs> the end of the world. Yeah. I mean, one thing I found quite interesting about the response is some of the countries which have responded perhaps most efficiently um, in terms of containing it have quite authoritarian systems of government. So I'm thinking particular China, Singapore, Hong Kong, where some liberal democracies seem to be struggling. I know there's a kind of an ongoing argument as to whether um, advances in AI and advances in technology will boost uh, authoritarian systems of government or, or liberal democracies. I mean, do you think that this could be evidence that um, in some respects, some of the kind of the, the new technology works quite well with the authoritarian modes of government, and we're, we're starting to see that actually play in the real world. The democratic uh, and the open societies try a lot of very different things, and when they find good solutions, they multiply them. They're much more creative, but it takes a long while to figure out what the best solution was. So when you want a quick and a sharp response, authoritarian governments have an advantage. The disadvantage of being authoritarian, though, is you better not tell the leader what he doesn't want uh, to hear. So China, on one hand, totally flubbed its initial response. Uh, after all, they put the doctor who started warning me about it in uh, almost in jail, and uh, they really wanted to downplay it. But once they realized that it was serious, they uh, took out all the stops and instead did a very firm response. But in many ways, it seems like uh, other countries like uh, Korea and Singapore, while auto authoritarian, but also more open to actually noticing uh, what's going on, actually listening to people did much better. Yeah. I mean, you've been kind of involved with or, or linked with the transhumanist movement for a long time now. I mean, if you were to go back 20 years, do you think that kind of events have roughly progressed as the movement would ex have expected? Uh, the funny thing is that uh, there is that saying that the future arrives in the wrong uh, speed and at the wrong order. And uh, we also <laughs> tend to underestimate the power uh, on, uh, of long term growth compared to short term growth. So if you had asked my 1990s transhumanist self, he would have been very bullish that by 2020, of course, nanotechnology is going to be pretty well developed and the anti aging treatments should be found at the corner drugstore. That yeah. has not happened. But my 1990s self would also have been totally flabbergasted by the power of uh, smartphones. But everybody is now connected globally and uh, using an actually quite powerful intelligence enhancing system. That where things like Wikipedia at our fingertips. But the advances in artificial intelligence are surprising, even practitioners. So in many ways, I think we are living very much in the transhumanist future. It's just that then even the transhumanists didn't predict it very well. <laughs> I mean, how much do you think the transhumanist movement has changed over the past couple of decades? Uh, it changed a fair bit. Uh, so when I got involved uh, in the early 1990s, uh, it was mailing lists and uh, we were discussing many of these interesting technologies. And then some of us moved out and actually started building careers and actually started doing it. And the political uh, views uh, started shifting as it got broader and it became a, much more a broad church and big debates, of course, between left wing and right wing uh, transhumanists uh, uh, about everything. And then eventually uh, you could say it became the state religion of California or at least Silicon Valley. Uh, and the fascinating thing that happens here is, of course, that you get different stages. It's almost like an ecological succession. So while the 1990s transhumanist was extremely optimistic about a lot of technology, it didn't think that carefully about the social impact or even how to be rational about things. 
in the early noughties, we started to realize social impact actually matters tremendously. And also improving the rationality of our thinking matters a lot. And of course, these days, um, we are also have a, a lot of work on existential risk, on actually realizing many of these dreams. Because by now, the people who were students in the 90s and were reading cool stuff on the internet, now we're running companies. Now we're actually making the dreams come real. I mean, one thing I've noticed, certainly over the past few years, is the transhumanist movement seems to be getting a lot more engaged in politics. Um, so obviously Zoltan running for the presidency in America, but you know, there's a transhumanist party UK and it's, it's transhumanist parties popping up all over the world. I mean, what do you think about that? I mean, should, should transhumanists try and become actively engaged in politics? I think it's important to be engaged in politics. It's just that I'm so sad to see too many people thinking that means they need to start a transhumanist political party. Because I think that actually saps a lot of your energy. You're going to get very busy doing something that's unlikely to be that helpful. I think where transhumanists can be really powerful, actually, is by starting think tanks, debating, participating, pointing out that, well, as a liberal and a transhumanist, I think we should be doing this. Uh, as a conservative and a transhumanist, I think we should be doing that. Uh, actually getting engaged in real politics is important. The, the problem is, of course, most people think that, oh, no, no, we need to invent an entirely new kind of politics, which might be good, but that's going to take a long time and a lot of energy. Uh, in the meantime, if uh, we actually want people to respond <laughs> to important transhumanist questions, we better be voices that can be heard in the debate. Yeah. Um, I mean, leading on to that, so I guess one of the, I mean, how concerned are you by your opposition to transhumanism? Because I, I guess as some of these technologies start actually rolling out in terms of, you know, AI, gene editing, that kind of thing, um, I mean, some people presumably will be quite uncomfortable with it and it, it could potentially become quite a, well, I mean, I'm sure it become quite a hot political issue. How, how kind of worried are you about the, the strength of the, object, the objections you might encounter? Uh, so back in the nineties, nobody were taking transhumanism very seriously. Up until Francis Fukuyama wrote our posthuman future, where yeah. he declared transhumanism as the most dangerous idea in the world, which was <laughs> great, uh, great marketing. And suddenly, <laughs> uh, transhumanism got a whole bunch of liberal bioethicists on its side because, well, if somebody who's kind of a neocon and allied with George W. Bush thinks something is bad, maybe there is something to the idea. Uh, and then, of course, the debate has been ongoing. It's just that when stuff is far away, we think about it in a very different mode from something practical and real. So while talking about stuff like life extension and nanotechnology and AI as something you see on the telly, at that point, people bring in various moral ideas and various pictures we got them usually from science fiction movies and have very strong opinions. But it's not about real stuff. Now, if it's on your healthcare plan on that hand, if you're actually seriously considering, should I be taking metformin to try to reduce the risk of aging? At that point, you shift into near-term mode and people's ethics also shift quite a bit. So I think their actual opposition is much more about the muddy, dirty, complicated stuff about how do we make this work well? When is it appropriate to carry around wearable computers? Uh, what forms of uh, genetic upgrades are okay, in, uh, at least for patient, uh, patients in the healthcare system, even though they would be doping if athletes took them? So I think the opposition to transhumanism today has shifted very much from the high faulting, deep philosophical and large principle stuff, even though, of course, some people still doing that debate, over to the more practical things about what technologies do we like and don't like and uh, which things do we discover side effects of so we backlash against them like the social media. It's kind of funny to notice that in the Jesuit Ethical Journal uh, a few months ago, there was an article arguing that maybe transhumanists and the Catholic Church actually should join forces against the common enemy, postmodernism. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's interesting that you mentioned the Francis Fukuyama argument, because um, my, my kind of understanding of his argument is basically that transhumanist technologies will allow such a divergence in human ability, um, so in terms of intellect and you know other abilities, that it will no longer be compatible with one person, one vote democracy. I mean, that, that would be my way of summing it up. I mean, do you think there's anything to that argument? Uh, well, I think actually liberal democracy is probably the political system that's most safe from a uh, diverse population. Uh, if you think about most of the other political systems, they get even more uh, disjointed if you actually can enhance and modify people. 
in some cases very disturbing ways. But I actually think liberal democracy, for all its faults, it actually allows the idea that, yeah, the voters are di a diverse bunch and don't all want the same thing and might want to live their own life projects. That is a very, very powerful idea that we tend to forget about today because we're all complaining about having elected stupid people. <laughs> but it's not really uh, about who you elect that it's about. It's about legitimacy. It's about actually respecting certain rights. It's about having an open society where people can point out that, look, I don't think this virus response is working. We should be doing something different. And if enough uh, people and experts f find that that's actually a sensible thing, we can change it. Yeah. Now, Fukuyama's uh, the critique deep down, I think it's even more about human nature. He fears that we might lose that factor X that truly makes us human. And I would, putting on my philosopher hat, say that mm, the, he's doing an essentialist reading of Aristotle. He thinks that there is something particular about being human and becoming not human is not something that is good for humans to do. While I think changeability is part of being human, we are a species that transform the world outside ourselves using technology and in ourselves too using technology and culture. So I actually think transhumanism is really in the sense it's the human spirit. Of course, we have rather fun debates when we end up debating each other about this. Yeah. I mean, I, I guess kind of leading on from that, um, I, my kind of understanding, his concern was basically that some in some humans, because we can kind of assume that not necessarily all humans will want to take advantage of technology, or, or not necessarily be able. To. Perhaps there was something that mm -hmm. And if you can't modify themselves. And if, if you have individuals who have, say, you know, five times the intellect of, of a standard human now, <laughs> they, they, they may not be prepared to share power on a one, on a one vote yeah. one basis system with us, in, in the same way that we wouldn't give votes to dolphins or chimpanzees. Yeah. Do you think there's anything to that? Uh, depends on how big the gap is. And you can still uh, realize that there are people in this society that are more than five times richer than you. Yeah. And there are probably people who are more than five times more knowledgeable about any political question than you. Uh, does that mean that uh, they shouldn't let you in on it? To some extent, we should just respect people who actually know enough stuff uh, or have enough stake in something. Uh, but generally, that's not really what a democratic system is about. Um, Alan Buchanan, a political scientist and uh, ethicist, wrote a very nice thing about enhancement where he pointed out if you get a break, if you actually have a separation, so the post-humans and the mere humans actually have nothing in common, they don't participate in the same society, then you definitely have a problem. But yeah. in most cases, we have actually a common core where both the smart people and the dumb people are trading in the same way. In the, in the same way. And the fact that they have very different insights is actually helpful rather than a bad thing, because we can they bring, bring in the insights and then uh, you can still do division of labor. Uh, so the, the question is, are there any risk that we get a radical break? And I think that is less draw, likely in the near future than many people would expect. Uh, just being smarter than others doesn't necessarily mean that you, you get a perfect life and uh, become super successful in our society. I mean, just look at the, our celebrities and leaders. They're not that smart. Yeah. Uh, and this goes exactly the same for the leaders in the business and many other disciplines. It, it's, sho it's shocking how normal most people are. And the geniuses, when you encounter, how rarely the, that genius actually allows them to totally transform the world directly. Indirectly, by writing papers or inventing things, they do transform the world. But it's actually a way more collective thing than we tend to think. Now, I think there is also another interesting an analogy, and that's the Amish people in the United States. So they want to live humble religious lives with no modern high tech. And they can do that because they're embedded into in a very immodest society that definitely doesn't uh, care about those things, but does care about certain rights and property rights, etc. That means that they can respect that some members are behaving in this odd way. The Amish would probably not have survived that well if they had their own nation. But being inside another system that protects you is actually not a bad idea. And it might be that in the future we are going to have human Amish who are, well, they want to be normal. Well, all the weird cyborg stuff going on on the outside, well, that's uh, not really for us. 
And that probably works best if you have the right relationship to the weird cyborg stuff. Yeah. I mean, one, her one argument I've heard from quite a lot of transhumanists is that um, human biology essentially needs to be upgraded. I mean, we've got you know, the same biology we had when we evolved. It means we're very tribal. Uh, we're quite inclined towards violence. And when, when you combine those primitive instincts with modern technology, you know, nuclear weapons, etc., um, I mean, you know, arguably it's only a matter of time before you have a disaster. I mean, do you think there's anything to that? Do, do you think that human's fundamental nature needs to change for us to have a long-term future as a species? I think we probably need to update some parts. Uh, uh, so Professor Julian Savalesco here in Oxford uh, and Ingmar Persson at the University of Gothenburg wrote a really interesting book called Unfit for the Future. Uh, they have been listening to me and Nick Bostrom going on about human enhancement and existential risk and put two and two together and realized, uh oh, we're in trouble here. We're getting very, very powerful, but we're still not that mature. And they realize that philosophers and preachers have been trying to get us to behave better for thousands of years with modest success. We might actually need to biomedically enhance our uh, moral capacity. That doesn't necessarily mean programming everybody to believe something, but it uh, could be something like, OK, we need to extend our ability for compassion, our ability to foresee the consequences of our action and control our own actions. Otherwise, we're likely to really end up in trouble. And I think uh, we're onto something here. I think that could be very, very useful. We, but I think we actually do quite a lot of our own self-control, also externally by using society. Steven Pinker, in his book, The Better Angels of Our Nature, has pointed out that it looks like the world has become significantly less violent over historical times. And a likely explanation is probably that we have better policing, rule of law, better governance, and a lot of these things. Maybe we'll also learn a few good lessons by reading a good philosophy, but uh, it's mostly that we have set up external incentives for behaving well. And we probably need to continue working rather hard on doing that with the, the new technologies we have, because otherwise we might get in very deep trouble. Yeah. I mean, one thing I found kind of, kind of interesting, I mean, do you think it matters hugely for world politics whether the key transhumanist breakthroughs happen in a liberal democratic country or an authoritarian country? I mean, I, I, I'm the Vladimir Putin, I can't remember the exact word he used, but it's something along the lines of, you know, whoever masters AI will rule the world. Ah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean, you, 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 sorry, sorry, carry on. Uh, yeah, uh, so, so it's fun, funny the context of Putin's somewhat sinister quote, because he was, of course, doing that, I think it was at a high school uh, technology exhibition. So it was the usual, useful, cheerful thing you tell kids that, uh, <laughs> yeah, the future belongs to you and whoever masters this technology will rule the world. So in many ways, with the right context, it's not at all as sinister. However, there is plenty of people in at least Washington, D.C., and quite possibly in Beijing, who think that, no, we really need to be, get ahead of everybody else when it comes to AI. And that can, of course, lead to an, a bad behavior where they see it as an arms race rather than a gold rush. Yeah. Now, when new technologies emerge... Um, where they emerge sometimes has a big effect. I think uh, the fact that uh, the computing world we live in emerged from the, Sil the Silicon Valley Cali uh, and California culture actually has shaped it a fair bit. There was a lot of civil libertarians thinking that computers should empower people and make you creative, etc. And uh, at least uh, for a long while, that was a very strong ethos that actually drove a lot of innovation. Didn't always turn out as they expected. But by now, of course, computers are everywhere. Same thing with any other transhumanist technology. Yeah, it might be invented in China. That means China has a chance of shaping it up to a point, but people will also adapt it and use it for very, very different purposes. Uh, it might be that some technologies are much easier to use in some regions. I could imagine that uh, using genetic engineering on your kids might be regarded as pretty okay by China, uh, somewhat uh, problematic in the US, but it still has a fairly uh, open market for reproduction technology. And I can totally imagine Europe saying, no way, that's just bad, wrong. And then yeah. a few years later, Europe suddenly has the problem of deciding, should we prevent people with the wrong genes from entering our borders? And at this point, the Germans get very antsy and say, no, wait a minute, this reminds us of something. We shouldn't be preventing enhanced people from entering Europe. But, uh, but yeah, so different cultures react to the same technology in different ways. After all, just think about GMOs. Um, so um, I think there is going to be a cultural element 
but the technology can often be reshaped in a lot of very different ways. It just takes time. I mean, is there a risk that the kind of, I mean, the way that the world is currently structured, so lots of competing nation states, or at least semi-competing nation states, means that when transhumanist technologies come along, um, essentially kind of anything will be utilised, there'll be no real control over, over what's used and what isn't used, um, because any country that thinks it can use something to its advantage potentially will. Um, and if, if that's the case, do you think there needs to be some kind of overarching control to, um, to kind of control the transhumanist revolution and keep it within certain boundaries? So Nick Bostrom has written a rather disturbing paper uh, called The Vulnerable World Hypothesis, where he posits that so far we have discovered technologies which are both good and bad, but none of them have been super dangerous. Uh, And he's thinking about, well, could we handle the discovery of a super dangerous technology, like a simple way anybody could make a nuclear weapon? And the current answer is, of course, no. Absolutely not. Uh, If that showed up, uh, it would be the end of the world. Uh, So the question is, could we create governance structures that could handle that? And he suggests some possibilities, all of them deeply worrisome and sinister. And uh, he he basically throws out the challenge, come up with something smarter. And I think it's pretty likely that we will need some forms of global governance of very powerful and very dangerous technologies. It's just that many of the enhancement technologies transhumanists are interested in yeah, they're in some sense profoundly powerful. They trans- might transform humanity and the world, but they're also local. I might try to enhance myself. That doesn't necessarily affect you. Yeah. That means we can actually do a lot of trial and error. And if it turns out that it was a really stupid enhancement, I'm going to be the one suffering from it. It's not necessarily going to spread worldwide. So we might need global control for the technologies that have an effect that directly affects the whole world. But for many technologies, especially one with complicated, unclear consequence, you probably want to let a thousand flowers bloom. You need to try a lot of things, learn from the mistakes, and actually allow people to fail in, uh, in various ways. Now, people are always going to try to control technology, but most of these attempts don't work very well. They only work for technology that nobody really wants, that are very, very expensive, or very obvious. Nuclear weapons, for example, requires very special ingredients and factories that are hard to hide. And uh, that means that you can ensure that relatively few countries have it. It's much harder to control programming because you only need a small computer and then you can do it. And I think um, uh, this is uh, an important issue of understanding that and then seeing, can we do something else? So one thing I'm writing a paper about right now is what we call differential technology development. Maybe some technology on the horizon looks pretty ominous, but you could make it safer. For example, if you could uh, do geoengineering to uh, reduce sunlight to control climate change, that sounds good if you're Bangladesh. It might sound rather dangerous if you're up in Scandinavia and don't want it to get any colder. So we might want to also have a method of undoing a change to the stratosphere. Right now, we have various ideas for how to put stuff up in the stratosphere to shield from sunlight. But if it was also a good way of cleaning it up, if we did a mistake, suddenly that technology would become much, much better. Same thing with quantum computers versus encryption. Same thing with various forms of bioengineering. If you do an enhancement, but you can also easily undo it if it turns out to be a bad idea, suddenly it became much safer. And the nice thing about making these safe making technologies available earlier is, of course, this is a positive thing. You can pay for it. You don't need to ban anything. You instead can get people's creative juices flowing. And how can I make these other things better? So there are ways of controlling technology without banning them or trying to globally control everybody. I mean, so slightly more, I guess, almost personal question, but which of the technologies that transhumanists are interested in or are you personally most excited in? I, mean, I, I, I heard you're quite interested in mind uploading, is that correct? Uh, yeah, I've been working on that since I'm a lapsed computational neuroscientist. So I did my PhD about simulating small parts of the brain. And the question is, what if you simulated all of the brain and the virtual body? Could you then make a copy or a, a continuation of a person in the computer? Yeah. And I'm certainly hoping that we will get there eventually. It's going to take a bunch of decades because the brain is pretty big. We, yeah. we have some impressive models right now of very small systems, and they're getting bigger and bigger year by year, but we have a long, long road ahead of us. 
And it's also very likely that artificial intelligence is going to become extremely powerful relatively soon. Not necessarily uh, the kind of self-willed uh, HAL-like uh, being, but at least very smart services that can solve problems for us, which might speed things up. I also have been working a lot on the ethics of uh, cognitive enhancement. What about making ourselves smarter? And the good news is there are various things like smart drugs that might be helpful for certain mental tasks. The bad news is it doesn't seem to be anything that really boosts intelligence itself. That seems to be a very complicated thing and we don't understand the brain well enough for that. But it might still be quite useful to control your level of alertness or creativity. And then, of course, there is an important one, life extension. Um, Transhumanists have, of, of course, essentially since day one uh, been saying we should really extend the human lifespan. And this is perhaps one of the most controversial claims uh, ever made. I, you get way more pushback uh, when I'm talking about life extension uh, than uh, when I'm talking about cloning or uh, uploading into computers or going to space or taking drugs uh, to become a more moral person. That's nothing compared to the potential that, oh, you might live much longer than you expected. Because this, of course, affects much of our direct existential dread of death and aging. Uh, and not many of us have built this story about how we handle our lives and how we think the shape of life should be. And then somebody shows up and says, actually, there is this weird result from a lab in California that might upend all of that. That is yeah. kind of dreadful to many people. So they get very upset and start defending disease, sickness and death very strongly. It's kind of weird because if one be actually believed their arguments, we should be shutting down hospitals left and right and, the, uh, and having people naturally and painfully die, which of course people don't normally do. Uh, normally, we are very keen on having a good hospital and ambulances. It's just that when it's something that actually changes the concept of what a life is, we get very nervous. The funny part is, of course, that by the time these treatments actually start showing up, we're not going to regard them as weird life extension. We're going to say, oh, yes, this prevents cancer, this prevents diabetes. And as a side effect, it uh, also means that you live 10 uh, healthy extra years or 50 healthy extra years and so on. But I think uh, actually this research is really important because it's about saving a lot of lives and actually giving people life quality on an enormous scale. And of course, also, I'm getting into my middle age. Uh, I have my first gray hair. So I rather want this to happen uh, within the next few decades. <laughs> um, have, have you signed up for these cryonics programs? or? Uh, so, yeah, uh, I'm signed up for cryonics and uh, I'm uh, involved a bit in the debate about the future forms of storing people in better ways. So there is, for example, the debate about traditional cryonics, which is all about cooling down a dying person. So life processes stop, freeze them so that nothing happens at all. And then hopefully you can revive them in the far future when technology has advanced so much that uh, you can both undo whatever damage they got from, uh, from the cryonics and whatever was killing them. But there is a new brand, uh, you could say, thinking that, well, actually these methods, uh, they're all based on just cooling down and then do minimal damage. But what if we just use something that really locked everything in place? So that would be more effective and you would need much more radical methods in the future, probably nanotechnology or the uploading into computers to revive them. But we also have better reasons to think that all the information is stored and nothing is lost. So there is an ongoing debate in the cryonics community whether this makes sense or not. Uh, I'm kind of involved there and generally trying to play peacemaker and uh, ethicist uh, because there is an interesting question on how much do you want to gamble uh, your future life on? Yeah. It, it's one thing if um, you're dying, then you should probably take the chance. But if you have a choice, now you also have a tough uh, decision to make. I mean, do you think that humans should have the liberty, if they so wish, to kind of chronic themselves while they're still alive, if that kind of makes sense? So rather than to wait until you die to, um, and, you know, all the damage is done, to do it whilst you're still alive. 
Uh, oh, oh yeah, I, I, I've written a, an ethics paper arguing for this. In fact, uh, in this paper, me and my co-author, we argue that many of the standard arguments people use against assisted dying uh, actually seem to be pro-cryonics arguments. Because many of these arguments say, oh, life is a precious gift. You're not supposed to give it up like that. Uh, you should really try to struggle on even if it's tough. Which actually seems to suggest that freezing yourself rather than accepting meekly that uh, you're de dying actually seems to be the right thing to do. Uh, and of course, if you could do this uh, not after people have been declared de dead by a doctor, but sufficiently ahead of time, to perhaps con uh, combine with assisted dying, even though the purpose here is not so much end your life as the hope of ending the current rather crappy version of it, and hopefully getting a better one in the future. That seems to make sense. It is a gamble because it might not work, but basically you're betting your remaining uh, life years for the future. And depending on how likely you think uh, cryonics is to work, at some point it might become rational. Of course, this might be an interesting problem for some transhumanists who might say, oh, uh, my life in the far future is going to be so amazingly good that I should throw myself into the nearest freezer right now, <laughs> which seems to be a bit too exuberant. In, indeed, it's an interesting question how we rationally judge these extremely uncertain things. So I'm writing a paper about that too, being a proper academic. Oh, yeah, in the future, do you potentially see humans living for, you know, sort of tens of thousands of years, there being almost no ceiling beyond, or I, I suppose even accidents, you'd be able to re-upload yourself, wouldn't you? Is, is there kind of any ceiling on how long a human could live? I think there is no fundamental ceiling, but you are going to need to solve certain problems. So as you say, accidents is the first one. The cryonics won't help you if the, a bus runs over you and turns you into mush. Uh, so... You need some way of handling that. So even if aging and disease is not a problem, you need to handle accidents. And probably that means having some form of backup copies. You need some form of uploading or artificial body. And of course, artificial bodies uh, and uploading, that's a good start. But probably the human brain uh, can't handle too much information. You need to extend it as you get older. Uh, you want to, in some sense, remember what needs to be remembered and maybe put other stuff inside storage. Uh, so we are going to have to redesign ourselves. So one of the fundamental paradoxes about really, really extended lifespans is, of course, that you are going to change throughout them. And some people say, oh, that means they're actually not an extended lifespan. You become somebody else. So actually, you're just a sequence of people. So at most, you get a one life which might still be relatively long compared to our current lives. Uh, but I think that doesn't remove um, the value. In fact, uh, we already have these different people in us. If we remember our life as a toddler or a school kid, those persons were actually quite different from our adult versions. In many cases, we could say they had different values, different goals, and uh, sometimes we might smile at them. Sometimes we were rather horrified what we believe uh, when we were younger. And that is probably as it should be. What we rather want is the sequence of lives that are ideally connected by common thread. There might be some wise uh, idea, there might be some personality trait, some emotion that you want to retain and build on forever. I mean, just one final question, slightly cheeky one. <laughs> um, but how, how, how different do you think the world will look in kind of 30, 40 years time? I think that a time travel going 40 years in the future is probably first going to be super disappointed because it looks almost <laughs> the same. Uh, it, it, at, on the surface, I think it's going to be looking very similar. They're going to be vehicles moving around, maybe without any drivers. Uh, there are going to be houses around and so on. And then they start interacting with people and they're going to realize that, whoa, this society works completely differently. Uh, in 40 years' time, of course, the kids of today who uh, are growing up and finding social media uh, uh, totally natural, they have gone through three or four media revolutions. There are entirely new media ways of communicating and organizing society. Uh, we are most likely going to have quite a lot of enhancements around, which are regarded as everyday. People are not going to think that the morning cognition enhancer pill is any weirder than the morning coffee. They might even be the same thing. 
the existence of a lot of machine learning making essentially every object fairly smart and uh, probably not nanotechnology making a lot of materials way more alive than we used to, it's going to be there, but mostly look very discreet. Just like we don't notice the carbon fibers in our, in our bikes these days, even though it's a super space age high tech material. Uh, so I think the more the time traveler goes around, the more confused they're going to get because a lot of things going on in the world wouldn't make sense to them. Just like some time traveler coming from the 1950s to the year 2000 would be absolutely shocked at how our social mores had changed. Yeah. A time traveler from 1900 going to 1950 would be really impressed by the technology but would feel rather at home with uh, morality and the fact that women knew their place and uh, of course gay people were banned from a polite society. But 1950 to 2000 time traveler would uh, not be impressed by the technology but be really surprised by the changes in attitude. Yeah. What I think the going 40 or 50 years in the future is going to be more of that. But it's going to be even more profound because it's going to be changes in how we think, how we feel, and also our idea that, yeah, my thinking and feeling are things I can construct and change and modify. So politics might be very much more about what we decide collectively and uh, what should we allow in terms of uh, moral enhancement? Should we make it obligatory that everybody uh, is a nice person? Or uh, do actually assholes have a right to be assholes? <laughs> and, uh, of, uh, you can have a campaign, of course, uh, where the sociopaths are pointing out that we, uh, we are voters too. <laughs> well, Anders, on, on the rights for assholes note, um, it's, 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 been, it's, been, it's, been, it's been a real pleasure. So thank you very much for your time.